I'm Alice Greenwald, President and CEO of the 9-11 Memorial and Museum, and it is my great pleasure to welcome all of you to tonight's program, along with those who are tuning in live on our web broadcast at 911memorial.org slash live. As always, we are delighted to see our museum members in the audience, and I also want to recognize and welcome U.S. Attorney Jeffrey Berman, uh, and Deputy U.S. Attorney Robert Kuzami of the Southern District of New York, and along with them, Gil Childers, who was the lead prosecutor for the 1993, the first 1993 trial um, of the, the bombers. Um, and we're just delighted to see all of you here um, as we approach four days from now, the observance of the 25th anniversary of the first terrorist attack at the World Trade Center. As most of you know, on February 26, 1993, at 12.18 p.m., terrorists detonated a bomb in the parking garage beneath the North Tower of the World Trade Center. The explosion killed six and injured more than 1,000. Tens of thousands of panicked and terrified people inside the buildings evacuated down completely dark and smoke-filled stairways. Others waited on tower rooftops for NYPD emergency service unit personnel to perform helicopter rescues. And due to a fa power failure that was caused by the bomb blast, some people were trapped in elevators for hours. The last survivors would escape to safety more than 11 hours after the bomb went off. The attack on that snowy afternoon triggered the largest emergency mobilization of first responders in New York City history, a record that held for another eight years until September 11th, 2001. While overshadowed by 9-11, the 1993 bombing represented a pivotal moment in the history of the World Trade Center, the city of New York, and frankly, our own national reckoning with terrorism in a global age. It was also a landmark moment for law enforcement and the justice system. The first of the perpetrators was arrested within a week of the attack, and by October of that same year, four of the co-conspirators were brought to trial in federal court in Lower Manhattan. Tonight, we are joined by Mary Jo White, former U.S. Attorney for the Southern District of New York, who oversaw the prosecution of the apprehended terrorists. Mary Jo White was the first woman appointed to hold this office and served from 1993 to 2002. During her tenure, she specialized in international terrorism cases, securing convictions for the perpetrators of the 1993 World Trade Center bombing, and creating a terrorism investigation unit within the Southern District. In addition, Mary Jo White's impressive record of prosecuting white collar crimes in the Southern District led to her 2013 appointment by President Barack Obama as chair of the Securities and Exchange Commission. White stepped down from the SEC in January 2017 and is currently a litigation partner and senior chair at Du Bois and Plimpton Law Firm, which she's told me she's returned to six times. <laughs> we are so privileged to have Mary Jo with us this evening, and I want to thank her for sharing her time and her insights with us. We are also deeply grateful to the David Berg Foundation for supporting the museum's current public program season. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Mary Jo White in conversation with the museum's Executive Vice President and Deputy Director for Museum Programs, Cliff Channon. Thank you so much, Alice. Uh, welcome, everybody. Welcome. Thank you. Um, it really is, uh, as Alice said, Monday, 25 years. And um, you were at that point, when the bomb went off in the World Trade Center, you were the acting U.S. attorney in the Eastern District, and you would be on your way here to the Southern District very soon thereafter. But I wonder if you could um, tell about your first impression when you heard the news and what you thought this might be, as opposed to what it turned out to be. Yeah, I think, and I was in the Eastern District then. Um, I was on my way to lunch um, and sort of with some colleagues from the Eastern District and heard that there, they thought there had been a bombing there. 
Um, I think two weeks later, I was nominated to be the Southern District U.S. Attorney. And so on March 1st, uh, this is less than two weeks, uh, I got a call from uh, Janet Reno, the Attorney General. I'm sitting in Brooklyn. And she asked if I was satisfied with the way the investigation of the Trade Center bombing was being handled. And I said, it's actually not my case because I'm in the Eastern District, but really from that day forward, you know, was kind of in charge of uh, overseeing it. What, what did and we think it was? I think initially, um, you know, I mean, I, I think as, as critics say as well, um, you know, thought it to be, you know, however motivated, uh, perhaps an isolated criminal act. Um, I was not of that view for very long, though. What was it that changed your view about that? It really was the continuing investigation of it. I mean, every single day, uh, learning more and more about the network. Um, while still in the Eastern District, I didn't actually come physically to the Southern District until June of 1993. I think Gil Childers, who's here, and Henry DePippo, who were the lead prosecutors in the first Trade Center bombing, came to my office in Brooklyn and informed me about another plot uh, going on, uh, same time, a week or so after the Trade Center bombing, when I learned about it, the Day of Terror plot, which was headed by the blind Sheik. Uh, essentially, that was the plot to blow up the bridges and tunnels connecting New York and New Jersey. And so that was investigated, prosecuted. And a combination of the, those two cases and what we learned during the investigation, didn't fully understand it. I mean, one of the things people didn't appreciate, I think, is you can convict people on sufficient evidence without knowing the full story. And so, um, if, certainly from my point of view, I just saw red lights blinking everywhere about how serious I thought this threat was from uh, international terrorists, uh, you know, I Islamic fundamentalists, how long-term I thought it was, and how little we knew about it, but how dangerous it was. And so, once we'd actually finished the Trade Center trial, the four defendants on trial were convicted, finished uh, uh, the Trade Center trial, finished the Day of Terror trial, where about nine others were convicted. I did form the first terrorism unit in any U.S. attorney's office prior to 9-11 because I wanted not to ever do another terrorism case, if I could avoid it. Didn't want there to be another terrorism case, but so that we could follow all the leads that we you know, had from the evidence we gathered there. Come back a little bit in time. Uh, as it's dawning on you that this threat is more than initially it appeared to be. Uh, how are you taking this information to the government at large? I mean, who are you talking to? How are they reacting to your sense that, wait a minute, this is much bigger than this one event, as bad as that was? I think it varied how people were taking it. How, how did, who did we communicate with? Clearly, the FBI. Um, I personally communicated uh, with Janet Reno, the Attorney General, uh, Louis Free, the director of the FBI, who had known for many years, um, and then you know it was in various conversations, you know, over time. I mean, I think different people, uh, particularly early on, had very different views of how dangerous or not it was. Uh, I remember during the Day of Terror uh, case, uh, the blind Sheikh, who we ultimately in indicted in that case, a number of people in the government didn't want to indict him, but rather to deport him. Uh, and my view was the worst thing you possibly could do when you have this long-term risk to the security of the United States is to deport someone and lose track of them. Mm -hmm. uh, so it took a while, I think, for most of our government to appreciate how dangerous the risk was. In terms of the prosecution of the 93 bombing, there were two trials because uh, two of the ultimate defendants were not caught in that first sweep that got four. But as you were preparing the prosecution, Gill and Henry and the others, I mean, did it seem like this was going to be clear and simple in terms of the prosecution? Or were there particular hurdles that you anticipated, either because this was kind of a new kind of case that the jury might not understand, or for national security reasons? Well, the national security issues in all these cases, and eventually I think we did 36 terrorist defendants, I mean, and you always ran into situations where you might not be able to use certain evidence in a case because of national security concerns. And that meant you were trying the case on less evidence than you would other kinds of cases. The first Trade Center bombing trial, uh, brilliantly tried by, by Gill and, and Henry and Mike Garcia and Lev Dassin, 
was really, Youssef wasn't there, who was the mastermind of the Trade Center bombing. Most of the evidence we had, in a sense, as I recall it, was about Youssef. So you, in effect, tried him in absentia and then connected the other defendants to him. It was you know, purely a circumstantial evidence case. You didn't have an insider. You had no confession. You had phone records and fingerprints. And it was, you know, it was pieced together quite you know, powerfully. You know, I'm not sure you know, all the jurors really understood it until the summation sort of you know, knitted it all together you know, for them. But it was really a very difficult case. The, the model that you have you know, downstairs, uh, you know, I th it, was, it was a very important piece of that to sort of make the bombing come alive. As I recall, three of the four defendants, typical lawyering, perhaps not good lawyering, you know, claimed there hadn't been a bombing. Uh, and if there was a bombing, my guy didn't do it, you know, kind of thing. And so, you know, to actually have the, really the scene of devastation, you know, come alive with the model was, was really very important. Obviously, six people and the unborn son of uh, Monica Smith, uh, the sixth victim, uh, you know, died tragically in that bombing as well. But it, it was a tough, it was a tough case. How do you, as U.S. attorney, follow the ongoing development of strategy? And what, what happens inside the office during a case like this? They will really give me up for this. So, you know, <laughs> Rob Kazami's out there, too, from the Day of Terror trial. I followed it rather closely. Uh, um, you know, uh, I was in the courtroom a lot. Uh -huh. um, I was meeting with folks a lot, probably, probably more so in the Day of Terror trial. You know, I, w I didn't physically get over to the Southern District until June of 1993, even though I was, a, I was bothering them before that. You know, I would catch up with the transcripts, I mean, you know, and offer thoughts. I mean, you know, the, these, the folks that did these terrorism cases in the Southern District were just, you know, spectacular prosecutors. They didn't really need my help, but they got it anyway. <laughs> <laughs> and so um, the first trial ends with the, with the conviction of uh, the, the four defendants. Very lengthy sentences by uh, Judge Duffy. Um, <coughs> at that point, though, you already have the second case uh, underway. Is that not the chronology? That is the chronology. And so how did you <coughs> see these two cases? How did you see these two cases? Were they both sort of the emanations of one group of people who were convinced that these were the kinds of things that ought to be done? Or were they sort of discrete acts with a couple of links between them? Um, I think the, the, there were links. Uh, the shake was clearly a, a link. Um, but we learned more and more about the links as time went on. Mm -hmm. uh, <coughs> some pieces uh, you know, remained uh, in isolation for longer than others. You know, we first learned a little bit about bin Laden um, in probably 1995. No idea who he really was. Um, eventually learned more. Uh, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, also the mastermind of 9-11, kind of came into the picture over the years. Mm -hmm. <coughs> you write... Yes, I'm here. I have my granddaughter, you know. We have a very helpful audience. <laughs> Thank you. Keep talking. Though. <laughs> yeah, uh, this, was my, this was my cue. I'm sorry I missed it. Um, the number of cases, as you alluded to before, uh, many defendants in a number of really critically important cases over the course of time. And um, what's interesting, you wrote in the first quarter of 2001, spring 2001, this article in the Middle East Quarterly, Prosecuting Terrorism in New York, which you know, up to that point is the state of the art of these cases of increasing international reach, increasing complexity, so as you're prosecuting them, and you might take us along through the list of these cases, um, are you really beginning to become more convinced that the threat is even greater than the last case revealed it to be? Without, without question, I think. I mean, you know, the Day of Terror trial really was a, it was a declaration of war, you know, urban terrorism war against the United States. <coughs> and everything we learned made us more fearful of the risk. And what does that do to the investigators and the prosecutors who are sort of watching this? And you have to be thinking, what don't I know about what's going on out there? Well, you still don't know. Yeah. You still don't know everything, I think. I mean, you learn as much as you can, as fast as you can. Um, you alert people to the dangers that you see. You piece together what you can. You neutralize with criminal cases if they're available. 
uh, dangerous terrorists, but you keep investigating. One of the interesting things, um, and it comes to the uh, Day of Terror case, otherwise known as the Landmarks plot, um, because we spoke about this earlier, and that particular investigation and prosecution really became almost a model, but it also set an example of what critics would latch on to as a kind of entrapment argument, because you did have an informant in the middle of this plot. You had the informant sort of feeding them sort of further steps into the plot, and yet this was a group that was clearly determined to do very, very great damage. So, you know, that was a very successful example of something that prevented a case. Well, and look, this was one of the biggest challenges I had when I first became the <clears throat> U.S. attorney. It would have been a challenge no matter when I had it, but I had just become U.S. attorney. Um, and in that case, we had an informant known as the Million Dollar Man, uh, paid a lot of money to be the informant, a lot of impeachment. Uh, <coughs> and we had the warehouse in which the co-conspirators were mixing, really building the bombs under surveillance. And so one of the decisions we had to make was, when do you take the case down? Mm -hmm. When do you actually <coughs> pardon me, arrest the defendants? And you never want to compromise you know, public safety when you're making those decisions. And so that really kind of fell to me to decide. And then you want to bring in, you know, you want your net as broadly, to be as broad as it can be, to bring in even, you know, more uh, dangerous terrorists mm -hmm. into the loop, more senior people. Uh, and so, you know, yes, there were entrapment arguments made. I mean, they, we successfully uh, rebutted those arguments. Uh, and you, you always will err on the side of public safety. Uh, even if you lose a couple people from your, you know, your criminal prosecution. The issue of informants and entrapment has continued uh, to be a theme in the yeah. assessment of these cases, not just uh, cases in the Southern District. And I wonder if you could step back and think about you know, uh, this on the grander scale. I mean, is there a risk of, of government being too aggressive in some of these cases? There can be. I mean, I think it, you, you have to... You know, I mean, I think you, it's, there's a lot of judgment involved. I mean, I think the, <clears throat> once the law was amended to provide for prosecutions for lending material support to terrorism, uh, and that was really after 9-11 when that really, you know, occurred, uh, you have to be careful that you're not, you know, kind of planting the idea and fomenting the idea. <clears throat> but I also think you have to be extraordinarily aggressive in these prosecutions. You know, and not just prosecute the leaders, but also prosecute those that, you know, rent the cars, mm. provide the ingredients and so forth. So it, it's a, it's a, you know, it's something you need people with judgment mm. uh, and discretion uh, to decide how best to do it. But you have to use informants One of the if, you, if you have the ability right. to have an informant. Right, right. One of the things that uh, you mentioned um, in this article is the development of the JTTF and the importance that it played... It expanded, I believe, to because of the 93 investigation. New agencies were brought into that and then became members of the JTF. <coughs> but explain to us, if you will, why that was so significant and the role that it plays. Well, the JTTF actually goes back to the FALN bombings back in you know, the 80s. Um, and it's basically the concept of the JTTF is you need interagency cooperation in order to successfully you know, ferret out terrorism as well as to prosecute it. Um, NYPD and FBI kind of being the lead agencies in that. Um, and it's so obvious that that is so. I mean, after 9-11, you know, you also, I think the world began to realize that needs to be a global, you know, JTTF in effect. Uh, one of the things that Louis Free did as director of the FBI before 9-11 was to establish liaison offices, you know, around the world. And that's what made possible um, stopping a lot of plots, uh, prosecuting a lot of defendants. And so the JTTF, in my mind, you know, lots of plots were foiled by the JTTF um, before 1993, before 9-11, and after 9-11. Uh, and, you know, I still call them, as I think I did before 9-11 in that article you were referencing, one of the heroes of the city. Mm -hmm. um, and there's some members here tonight from the current JTTF, and, you know, we owe them an awful lot. Yep, yep. Um is that you talk about the model, but it was not necessarily the easiest thing to get underway. We had an earlier program here about those first early days of the initial uh, creation of the JTTF, and then 
you know, the FBI NYPD relationship, not always the smoothest. And then, you know, what is the issue of adding these agencies and making sure that they continue to cooperate? How does that happen? Well, that, you know, it, it's, it's people driven, you know, both at the leadership, um, you know, level, but also really at the line level, I think. I mean, you, if you share the, I mean, you know, just stepping back for a second, talking about these cases in the U.S. Attorney's Office, you could not be more committed to the mission than those cases. I mean, all, all the cases that you handle as a prosecutor are important to you. But these are really national security kinds of cases. Security of the city is at stake. And when you get agents from different agencies who work with each other in the trenches, who share that commitment, the cooperation flows. You sometimes want to keep the leaders out of it. You know, they can mess it up, basically. Mm -hmm. uh, and look, there have been some, you know, there's no question that there have been, you know, after 9-11 particularly, I think, some might say before, you know, some tussles between NYPD and, you know, the FBI, for example. But by and large, you know, the combination of those two lead agencies and all the other agencies, the Port Authority included, um, you know, have brought about things and prevented plots that would not have, you know, not have been prevented had you not had that level of cooperation. But you have to keep working at it. As you think about the uh, cases that you prosecuted over the tenure in the Southern District, how did the legal strategies evolve? Did they become more sophisticated? Did they put new tools in play? Or were you, through this period, working essentially with the same toolbox? Well, every case was different. I mean, I think I mentioned the first Trade Center trial, which was really circumstantial evidence alone. You had an informant in the second trial, the Manila Air Plot, which was one of the other cases where Youssef was a major player, which is basically a plot to, uh, you know, blow up uh, literally 12 jumbo jets coming back, U.S. carriers coming back from uh, the Far East to, you know, various uh, U.S. citizens. He actually, um, on the plane back from Pakistan when he was apprehended, you know, actually talked about that. So you had some pieces of a confession to use in both the Trade Center trial and the Manila Air trial. One of the most frightening things about uh, what he didn't say, though, was one thing he wouldn't say is he was bragging about what he did in the Trade Center bombing in 93 and what he did in Manila Air was just how he smuggled, you know, through security the ingredients to basically blow up those planes because he said, I've got people, you know, around the world to, uh, who, who, who know that technology. Mm -hmm. I don't want to, you know, I'm not going to let you guys know about that. Another you know, there was a computer that had a lot of evidence. Uh, on we have it downstairs in the museum. Yeah, yeah. yes, uh, the, the Bajinka plot. And I confirm with Mary Galligan, who's here tonight, that there are still portions of that computer of Yousef's uh, that were encrypted. We could, didn't have that evidence at the trial because no one could crack the code that still haven't been cracked. Mm. So, so, yeah, so that, that case was different. In East Africa embassies, uh, which, and that occurred in 1998, 224 people losing their lives. Um, innocent people in our embassies. Most of the evidence there, you know, came from abroad, as it, as it would. Uh, we also had c confessions from two of the defendants that our assistants obtained when I sent them over to mm -hmm. Tanzania and, and to Kenya to, to get those. So everyone was really different. I think what changed the most, and every case is different, whether it's terrorism or, you know, you have evidence, sometimes you have confessions, sure. sometimes you don't. Sometimes you have fingerprints, sometimes you don't. Um, what differed most over time, I think, was the greater degree of cooperation we got from the intelligence community. When we first started, um, understandably, actually, um, no real relationship had had to be, be built then between law enforcement and the intelligence agencies in terms of using evidence in cases involving international terrorism that had a national security component. And so naturally, on the intelligence side particularly, you were concerned that that was going to be compromised. You know, sources and methods and, you know, and others that were out there that might prevent the next attack might have to be turned over in a criminal trial. And that's obviously a grave, grave concern. Over time, and we knew, by the way, in every one of these cases, uh, I think there were six in all <coughs> while I was there, that we might have to pull the plug because we would run into something in the case that required us under the federal rules of uh, discovery to provide evidence to the defense that, you know, was just too important from a national security point of view to provide it. And so we would have to let that terrorist go out the door. Uh, <coughs> talk about pressure, right? Uh, we were able to get 
fortunately, protective orders from the judges uh, that allowed us to satisfy the rules, uh, be fair about it, and not run into that barrier where we had to pull the plug. But over time, the intelligence community understood we were going to protect national mm -hmm. security. Mm -hmm. And so they were more forthcoming, I think, as my impression, uh, with what was made available to us to at least consider uh, using as evidence. Um, you know, one of the things that when I was U.S. attorney, I probably spent, I would say, 60 percent of my personal time on terrorism. I mean, not expecting to ever do that in the white collar district of the Southern District of New York. Uh, and I work, you know, all but four hours a day, so it's a lot of time. Uh, but I would get calls, you know, in the middle of the night from Gil or Henry or Rob and saying, well, the British have somebody, I'm making up British, but it was the British sometimes, who had detained someone who was connected to one of our investigations or cases uh, and asking, can we take him? Can we take him in as a defendant in one of our cases and prosecute him in the U.S. courtroom because they were going to have to let him go. They didn't have enough. And so I always had two questions. One was, what evidence do you have? Good question, right? The second question, what evidence can I use? Two very different questions in these cases because there was always a chunk of evidence you just could not use because of how much more important it was on the national security side. So you're increasing cooperation and trust from the intelligence community is sort of the mirror of the JTTF on the law enforcement side. They're beginning to see that this is a whole of government prosecution, essentially, where as an international event, they need to be part of it, even if they're giving you some of their crown jewels. Yeah, no, I think that's right. And, and you know, and again, w there was an awful lot of evidence um, that I would have loved to have used. It's a, I mean, it's interesting. We, we, we ended up uh, in all, I think there were I think there were there were thirty some defendants in all that we indicted and convicted, and there weren't. And I don't say this in a boastful way. Um, there weren't any acquittals, and so I think the world at large thought these cases were really easy to do, uh, whereas they were excruciatingly difficult to do. I mean, there was a lot of behind the scenes stuff that nobody ever knew about. What's the nature of that stuff? I don't know if you can give the detail, well, of it, but what is the nature of the problem? It's, it's really what I was saying. You know, I mean, just, you, 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 it, how thin some of the cases were, mm -hmm, the evidence. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, there was enough, you know, to go forward, but, but thin, there was evidence we couldn't use mm -hmm. that would have been, would have made it a very strong case, whereas I had a pretty weak case instead. Take us back to, um, after the, uh, the first four are arrested in the 93 bombing, Yusuf is still at large. What's your sense of him and the threat that he poses at that point as a result of the 93 bombing? I mean, I thought, and again, we learned more over time. Um, I thought he was an extreme threat. Uh, and again, it's that threat from abroad that you don't know where he is. Mm -hmm. You don't know when he's going to strike next. And the next, at least I hear of him, is from the Philippines, you know, where fortunately there was a fire uh, in the apartment in Manila where, you know, bombs were being mixed and, uh, and made, basically. Unfortunately, in the Manila air plot I mentioned before, uh, he actually did a test run where, um, right. you know, he basically a, a Japanese citizen on a on a uh, flight was was killed in that test run. Um, I mentioned before what he wouldn't tell the agents coming back from Pakistan. There are others of my colleagues out there, uh, you know, you know that are that are basically they know how to you know, smuggle these ingredients, you know, through security uh, to have the next Manila Air plot occur. And of course, you've had more recently very similar plots uh, foiled right. in London and and so forth. You know, and I think one of the most, uh, you know, head jerking, I guess is the phrase I would use, experiences that I ever had, was watching uh, Youssef. He, when he came back in, I guess it was 95, mm -hmm. uh, he was tried first for the Manila air plot. And he announces, I think on the day of the openings or close to that, that he wants to represent himself, you know, pro se, which is under our constitution basically permitted after the judge warned you how not smart that may be. Um, and, you know, you could see the jury, you know, just sort of physically recoil uh, when they realized that, you know, this lead terrorist defendant, at least accused, was going to be standing three feet away from them trying this case. And he was. I mean, keep in mind, English is not his first language. He's not a lawyer by training. And without insulting overly the other lawyers in the case, you know, I think he was the best lawyer in the case. I mean, you know, he was brilliant. He was absolutely brilliant. Uh, so I have always thought he was one of the most, you know, so, some people have, you know, over time, I think have minimized how major a player he was. 
you know, I don't sort of get into ranking how major the players are. I get into ranking how dangerous I thought they were. And I thought he was one of the most dangerous people on the planet. Uh, did, did you uh, have any occasion to interview him or be present for those interviews as U.S. attorney, or was that left to the, either the FBI or anybody else? No, and he, wasn't, he really wasn't, uh, you know, allowing himself to be interviewed, except back on the plane okay. from Pakistan that yeah. I mentioned. I was, however, um, in the FBI command center when he was brought back from Pakistan. I mean, one of the, uh, someone, you know, has asked, you know, how did these cases sort of end up in New York, the ones that, you know, certainly involve the Manila air plot, for example. And it's really, it's either in Washington, D.C. that there's venue under our laws, or it's in the district where that defendant is first found. Mm -hmm. And so I was sort of monitoring his being flown back from Pakistan in bad weather uh, to Stewart Airport in the northern reaches of the Southern District of New York when someone wanted to land him at Kennedy. And I said, you can't land him at Kennedy because I won't have venue over him if you land him at Kennedy. Uh, and so, uh, but, but, you know, I saw him come off the elevator when he was brought into the command, uh, you know, the FBI command center. Uh, there was no exchange of, but I wanted to be there. Mm -hmm. I wanted to be there. I wanted to see that he was safely in custody. How do you account for his views? I mean, how do you weigh the factors of religion, politics, personal hatred, however it matches up in your mind? You know, some of that I don't profess to understand even now. I mean, clearly we were regarded, we meaning the United States, you know, as the great Satan. Combination of reasons for that. Um, Mostly the bottom line, I would say, is if you don't follow the beliefs of the terrorists, and again, I think they, you know, obviously defiled the, you know, the very honorable religion of, you know, Islam by, you know, their own beliefs. Um, but we represented everything they hated, mm -hmm. basically. Um, and so we were the great Satan. So, and, and, you know, so there, there, beth there basically was no, you know, compunction about killing women and children in order to you know, topple our government, which was li literally the, you know, the objective. In relation to the Manila plot for the planes, um, his partner in crime, literally, was Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, who would, right. of course, come back at 9-11. Was, was uh, KSM on your radar at that point as an important figure to be found uh, as a result of these earlier cases and the investigations? He, he, again, in my recollection, he came into our radar screen much like bin Laden did, very slowly. Um, we knew, I believe, at the time we did the Manila Air trial, uh, that he had provided some of the money for it later, and he was indicted for it under seal, eventually unsealed. Um, and, you know, he, he really was probably the mastermind of Manila Air as, as well as what everyone says, and I, I have no reason to doubt it, of 9-11, or certainly one of the masterminds. Um, one of the tragedies of, you know, uh, there are many of them, frankly, in some ways. I mean, obviously, bin Laden was not, you know, captured in response. We indicted him twice, yep. um, including for the East Africa Embassy bombings. But we were, you know, the FBI was extraordinarily close to getting uh, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed into custody uh, in, you know, I forget the year, whether it was 97 or 98, uh, in, in gutter, and he basically, or however he managed it, escaped, you know, within a half an hour of when he would have been on the plane back to the United States. You know, that, that can't tell you necessarily that 9-11 wouldn't have happened, but it's one of my other views on this is that disruption is huge. Uh, you know, when you disrupt something, whether you're an intelligence agency or you grab a leader and put them on trial in the civilian criminal court, the plot may not happen or it may not happen yet. <clears throat> and it can give law enforcement a chance to catch up and maybe prevent that plot. So that was a big tragedy. You mentioned the indictments, too, out of the Southern District of uh, Osama bin Laden. Um, how did those indictments relate to these other cases and what you had learned from those prosecutions and investigations? The, the first indictment against bin Laden was essentially a conspiracy to attack um, American defense facilities abroad. Uh, and we had that information from someone who ultimately became a cooperator, El Fadl, uh, in the East African Embassy bombing trials. And then he was indicted again shortly thereafter in 98 for the East African Embassy bombings. Um, you know, I think, and, and sort of, you know, you hear this from others as well, as soon as East Africa happened, we knew enough about bin Laden then. Uh, and, and keep in mind, Tanzania and Kenya, they're 
the bombings are very close together, showed a kind of sophistication that you hadn't seen before. Uh, and those of us involved in, in this matter, including in Washington as well as New York, you instantaneously, we could have been wrong, but basically said it's bin Laden, it's bin Laden. And if you look at the East Africa Embassy indictment, and there are about you know, a dozen to 14 defendants there, six ultimately, uh, maybe seven ultimately you know, tried and convicted, um, the entire Al-Qaeda leadership is laid out in that indictment. And so by then we knew a lot more uh, clearly than we knew in 1993, I mean, by, you know, a huge, you know, margin. One, you know, again, one of the uh, somewhat, somewhat, I guess an, I would call it an irony to some degree, a little disturbing irony uh, to a greater degree perhaps, but after 9-11, my understanding is that the military initially used our al-Qaeda indictment to find, to decide who to go after to try to apprehend once we were in Afghanistan. So that showed you how much we knew or perhaps how much we didn't know, yeah. you know, as a government at large. But It also speaks to the integration of the law enforcement yeah. efforts here and what would become, of course, this, this global effort in the years right. ahead. Were you in the Southern District uh, an active part of the more international investigations or considerations of what was going on? Or was it simply that, not simply, but was it that you were concentrating on your cases which generated this information that was then fed into the system. But did you sort of, in terms of your sense of what was going on, extend out of the Southern District into this global issue? Well, of necessity, I think we extended outward because of the nature of the cases and the players that were in it, the nature of the threat. But no, I mean, I have to say, I've learned a lot since 9-11 uh, from the 9-11 Commission and otherwise. My impression was we were clearly trying to share any information that we had with other parts of, of the government, and that's why I formed the unit, frankly, mm -hmm. but that we were just a small, you know, sort of tool in the arsenal in terms of this, you know, larger, very serious threat from Islamic fundamentalist terrorists, terrorists around the world. Um, the military were doing things, the intelligence community were, were doing things uh, that we really were not privy to. Right. Um, since 9-11 and some of the findings, suggests to me that less was going on than I thought was going on elsewhere. Um, I remember testifying before the, uh, after 9-11, before the Joint uh, House-Senate Intelligence Committee, and one of the congressmen asking me, didn't you need help? And I, I said, uh, with the cases? You know, I mean, I could use any help I can get, obviously, but, but no is the answer to that. And basically, the, his point was, you were, you were kind of, you were the only game in town. And I said, well, I didn't think that then, and frankly, I don't think that now, but I've learned a lot since then that lead me to believe there was less going on elsewhere than I thought at the time. Well, that leads to this next question, which is, you know, the retrospective sense of what was being done pre-9-11 is that it was principally considered a law enforcement problem, and post-9-11 it becomes a military and a global problem. Mm -hmm. Do you accept that assessment? And if you do, is it a flawed way of looking at what we did in those times? From my perspective, again, with the caveat from what I just said, mm -hmm. uh, I didn't think um, it was being handled, to, international terrorism was being handled as a law enforcement matter. I thought we were one sort of tool in the arsenal when it made sense. Uh, there's some, been some sort of critiques that, you know, we wanted to do everything as a, you know, as a criminal case. Absolutely not true. Um, we were asked to do cases from time to time, and we did them if we could do them. I thought it was a matter for the military long before 9-11. I mean, long before 9-11. I mean, you know, when? I mean, clearly, you know, shortly after the Day of Terror trial was done. We learned enough in those two cases and investigations to make me think this is war. We are at war. War has been declared on us, and this is primarily a matter for the military. Um, so I had a very different perspective, perhaps, than was the reality, you know, globally, speaking of the, the U.S. government globally. Post 9-11, um, you were still U.S. attorney for several months after the 9-11 attack happens. What was your sense of that? Obviously, the disaster is a disaster, but, you know, was this, was this even greater than you had feared it could be, or was this somehow than just the next step in this awful, awful No, I, th this was greater. I mean, I think, and I think it's Colin Powell who 
said this was a failure of imagination on the part of even those of us who took the risks most seriously, I think. I mean, for example, I think we all thought uh, involved in these matters, investigations and cases, that the World Trade Center was remained a target. It would likely be bombed again or certainly attempted to be bombed again. Um, but attacks on the level that occurred on 9-11, um, I certainly didn't envision that, and I don't think anybody, anybody did. Uh, you know, it, it's qualitatively not so different in the sense that, you know, I've already said I thought we were at war, war had been declared on us, but this was kind of proof positive of that beyond my imagination as well. Did you think, um, seeing what was happening here, that there would be a role for the, your, your office or other U.S. attorney's office in sort of prosecuting this, or was this just so far beyond that at that point? You know, again, my view, and, and clearly after 9-11, was this is a matter for the military. Yeah. Um, you know, I think there was a lot of misinformation out there about, for example, if there were to be more uh, civilian criminal trials, were we fighting to have them in New York versus Washington? That's not true. Uh, we basically, you know, cooperated in the effort to get all of the expertise to Washington, including the New York FBI, uh, some of the intelligence information, some of the assistance went to Washington, where it could all be in one place. I mean, one of, one of the things that I did find, uh, and this was very early on, quite frightening, frankly, given the nature of this risk and danger, was something called the wall, which was basically, you know, you've heard of FISA lately, right? Uh, the, uh, uh, essentially, information being collected on the intelligence side of the House couldn't be shared with the law enforcement side of the House until the Attorney General declared that you were actually going to bring a criminal case. So some of my assistants probably knew more about Al-Qaeda than maybe anybody in the United States, as it turns out, but they couldn't learn what that information was that was being gathered by the intelligence community. And so, you know, how do you hope to sort of connect the dots when that doesn't happen? You warned about that at one point. I did. I, I warned about that in 1995, actually, because it was basically, I mean, understandable but wrong, I think. Um, you, you certainly want to safeguard the ability to get the FISA warrants, you know, to collect intelligence. Um, but I think uh, the Justice Department was too conservative about the litigation risk of that. There was nothing in the law that said... You couldn't share information with the law enforcement side. The law just said you can't, you know, use it as a subterfuge to collect, uh, you know, information. You can't mix the intelligence and the law enforcement side. So I did urge that the wall be brought, you know, down um, as, as far down as it could be down. And really that did not happen until after 9-11. Well, post 9-11 as well, though, there's this new model of prosecution, if that's even what to call it, with this resort to the military tribunal, um, yep. Guantanamo and so on. And your views of that evolved over the course of time. They did. My, my view after 9-11 was that, and really based on the experience we'd had in these other cases, I've mentioned already how close some of the calls were, I thought, um, of having to pull the plug versus you know, having to turn over information required to be turned over under the discovery rules, that once you were, in effect, in the caves in Af Afghanistan and getting all kinds of additional information, and you had live detainees in Guantanamo, that those obligations in the civilian criminal courts would be impossible to satisfy. Um, Massawi was obviously tried in D.C., and at least the orders that were handed down satisfied that obligation, at least according to the, you know, the, the D.C. courts. Um, so I actually advocated, I mean, the, the President Bush announced shortly after 9-11 the creation of the military tribunals, that Massawi be tried in a military tribunal. Unfortunately, the procedures weren't built out for the military tribunals for, you know, really more than a year later, I think. Um, having watched the, pardon me, having watched the military tribunals work, however, I've kind of come full circle back to the, mm. the best place to deal with, you know, captured terrorists at least, um, where you have the evidence is in civilian criminal courts because, I mean, we, we all sort of have followed or many of us have followed you know, KKM, uh, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed is still in Guantanamo, as are others, awaiting trial years and years and years later. The defense attorneys, the military defense attorneys have quit, basically. I mean, there's just, you know, complete dysfunction. Um, ben Laden's driver uh, was actually convicted in um, a military tribunal and sentenced to time served. Um, you know, again, my philosophy in these cases, as I mentioned before, is you prosecute 
as vigorously as you can every single player involved in the terrorist plot, and so that you know uh, that the um, the guy who provides the rental cars, uh, if he's subject to a life sentence, he should be given a life sentence for deterrence purposes. So, so they've not been effective. I mean, they've been grossly ineffective. I think the military tribunals, whereas I think the criminal, the civilian criminal justice system has been quite effective. Where do you see? I mean, it's it's now years after 9/11. We're coming up on 17 years. So we've been at war for all of this time, extending into various directions. Uh, there have been homegrown plots and prosecutions successful in many of these cases. But where do you see the risk that you first perceived in these original cases? Is it much greater than it was? Is it now spread to more people who pose that risk? How do you see this, this horizon now? I think it's equally dangerous. I think it's equally long-term, I think it's more diffuse. Um, I think I described in that um, speech I gave, and certainly before 9-11, Al-Qaeda being kind of the joint venture of various terrorist organizations. So it wasn't like, here's Al-Qaeda. You had, you know, other branches that were sort of, you know, part of that. So there was some diffuseness even then. But now what you have are people who want to, they're, they're wannabes in effect. I mean, they're inspired by of the terrorist doctrine. You know, look, I worry about the homegrown terrorists. I worry about um, the danger that's posed from lower level attacks, the suicide bombers, you know, the car in, you know, Times Square. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think one of the things that may have helped us after 9-11, uh, obviously we enhanced security in all kinds of ways that, you know, badly needed to be enhanced, uh, FBI, GTF, NYPD, Great job, but you also had at least Al Qaeda, you know, who always were very much into symbols, attacking symbols, and sort of one upping themselves. So if you have to do something greater than 9 11, that is a lot harder to do. If instead you have a more diffuse risk uh, with players you don't control under any kind of hierarchy, under any kind of discipline, um, you know, then you can have, you know, multiple attacks occurring on a lesser scale, but with more frequency and I think with great potential to really wreak havoc with the, you know, the world psyche, certainly the American psyche. So, so I, you know, I, my sort of bottom line is, you know, we just can't be, it's, the risk evolves, it's more diffuse, but never can we be complacent right. about it. But you're, you seem, on the other hand, quite confident in the expanded capacities of law enforcement through this cooperation among the different agencies and with the intelligence community? I think it's improved. I think it's enhanced. It's significantly enhanced. But I mean, it's, you know, you've also got, this is a global threat. And so I mentioned before sort of the world coalition being so important to fighting and combating international terrorism. If you've got one country, you know, where that's not part of that coalition, that's going to be where your next plot occurs. Yeah. So we certainly don't have perfect comprehensive cooperation globally. Yeah. Yeah. Let's see if there are some uh, questions out uh, in the audience. And I'm just going to ask everybody to wait for uh, the microphone to come out, because the microphone isn't out yet. Well, then we won't wait for the microphone to come out. Oh, here comes a microphone. Um, let's start on this side where Harmony is, so it's closer. Anyone over here? Going once, going right here. Gentleman right there. Hi. Are you at liberty to talk about Ali Muhammad at all and his relationship to the various cases? I'm really not. I mean, there's, there's, uh, I apologize, but I, you know, there's, there are things in my brain that I still can't talk about, and that's one beyond, obviously, what's public, which you already know, I'm sure. Yeah. Quick one. Um, it's Charlie, go one second. Hang on, wait for the mic. Okay. And identify Thanks. yourself, Charlie. So you Charlie Makish, I was the uh, <coughs> director in 93 of the Trade Center. And invaluable to us in the 1993 uh, trial. Thank you for saying that. Mary Jo, putting both hats on, the SEC hat and uh, the hat having to do with, uh, you know, combating terrorism, and the question that was often, often asked by the Mossad, which was to cut off the head of the snake by, by starving it to death financially. Um, can you comment on the issue of... Um, you know, financial privacy as versus the ability to uh, track and, uh, and um, seize 
funds that are being used in uh, terrorist activities? Yeah, I mean, I th a couple points on that. I mean, one, I think we probably did less on that front than we should have before 9-11. On the other hand, it costs very little. Certainly, you talk about the, you know, the 93 bomb, what, less than $10,000 or something. I mean, you know, Youssef again commented that if he had more money, he indeed would have succeeded in toppling the two towers into each other in 93. So I think it's, you know, it's, it's essential uh, to very aggressively pursue all sources of funding for terrorist operations. And again, back to my disruption point, I mean, even grabbing some funds of not huge amounts might disrupt a plot, gives you a chance to prevent it. You, you'll find, well, certainly in, in my case, uh, I much more err on the side of security and national security than I do privacy. Uh, I mean, I think it, it's a matter of survival for us. So, you know, you, you, you need and you have safeguards, you know, in the law for privacy. You should have that. But I worry about that from, you know, electronic surveillance, you know, the, the controversy there as well. You know, whereas, you know, the, the, how do you balance the privacy interests with the needs of law enforcement and intelligence to get the information they need to get? Having lived through these cases and feeling the way I do about the, the, how dangerous it is, I err on the side of being aggressive in collecting that information. You know, one of the things this suggests, though, and you, you write about this elsewhere, is that um, as the prosecutions went public with the evidence and to the degree that they did, the way it was gathered, Al-Qaeda studied these cases and learned about how their vulnerabilities had been exposed and exploited by these investigations. So they are all learning organization as well in your sense of that. Yeah, no, no question about that. I mean, I think, I think they probably learned less from those cases than has been written about and, and uh, sort of opined about, but they clearly did learn from those cases. And again, that, that is a price of those cases. I mean, I think that's why you will you know, hear a lot of folks arguing for, you really ought to be interrogating on the intelligence side, learning what you need to learn to prevent attacks and not exposing, uh, you know, what you know, uh, so that they can learn, you know, in, in a civilian criminal, you know, trial. I mean, you know, it's a balance. Um, we'll look over here, this gentleman there. Hello, um, I'm uh, Andy Von Salas, and as a lawyer, I uh, was glad to hear you talk about the um, need to be fair in making adequate discovery of uh, criminal evidence. Uh, I'm wondering uh, who makes the decisions on certain other tactics, uh, tactical considerations in these prosecutions. For example, if there are special administrative measures that have to be imposed on the way defense counsel can function. Um, was that something that you would involve yourself in, or would it be the kind of thing that Mr. Fitzpatrick would decide on his own, or did it come from higher up from the intelligence community or something else? Uh, I certainly was involved in those decisions. Um, and this is <coughs> the so-called SAMs, basically. I mean, one of, one of our you know, grave concerns uh, was information being passed, as you know, through attorneys you know, to the outside world in a way that could signal to others, you know, sort of how to do, when to do, you know, the next attack. I don't mean to, I'm oversimplifying a little by saying that. Look, I mean, one of the things that I feel, you know, more generically, so I was involved in those, I approved of those, I thought they were necessary. Uh, and I understand, you know, how severe they were. I mean, I guess is the best way to say that. I mean, one of the reasons that I, uh, you know, basically uh, favored the military tribunals after 9-11, the reasons I said, I just didn't see how you could, without lowering the bar uh, on our criminal justice system, I just didn't see how you could satisfy any longer, knowing how difficult it was before 9-11, you know, the rules of fairness and our criminal discovery rules and successfully prosecute. And the last thing you want to do is become people we're not when we pursue these cases. And so, but it's excruciating. I mean, I will say, I mean, it is a, I mean, you, you have to do what you're permitted to do lawfully uh, in order to protect yourself and the, and the national security. But you've always got to have in your mind, what are you doing to fairness? What are you doing to the system? Um, and I'm not going to pretend those are easy calls. In the middle there.
Uh, Jewel Weiss, not a lawyer, but employed at the, uh, the World Trade Center from 1981 till 9-11. Uh, My question is, is when the Bush administration supposedly, and I don't know the information, had gotten warning that something was about to happen, were, were there other arenas that were also aware of those warnings, or were they not really important enough or to pay attention to? Before 9-11, you Before mean? Before 9-11, because yeah. you had already, I mean, from what uh, you're saying, you were very aware of the threats in general. And, and certainly in, in general, there's no question. I mean, look, I, I'll tell you from my perspective, um, and again, there's been a lot written and a lot of findings on this that have much more information than certainly I had before 9-11 and frankly that I know now in terms of who knew what when. But, you know, approaching 9-11, and again, remember that wall I talked about and there can be information being gathered on the intelligence side that, you know, myself and the assistants in the office would never hear about, some in the FBI would not hear about. We were aware there was a level of concern um, but that's about all we knew. Uh, we didn't have any you know, specific information. I will tell you that when I was in the command center after 9-11, the FBI command center, and I was there for about six weeks after 9-11, um, and the materials on Misawi, you know, the so-called 19th hijack or whatever, um, came into the command center. I knew absolutely nothing about him. Uh, neither did anyone else in our office, and, and the New York FBI didn't know about him. And I also saw that they didn't seek a warrant, you know, either a search warrant or, you know, a FISA warrant. And I know, and again, I'm not suggesting it would have prevented 9-11. I mean, I'm not at all suggesting that. But I know what would have happened if we'd had that information. We would have gotten a warrant and we'd have learned a lot more before 9-11. So, you know, I'm not a person that points fingers at this. I am a person who, since 1995, has said you've got to have all the information known to our government, you know, in one place and being looked at by the minds, you know, uh, who know what they're looking at. And clearly, there we didn't have that before 9/11. Let me read from this article you wrote in 2001 because it really summarizes where we were then, and I want you to. Contrast it with where you think we are now. And this is before. This is before 9/11. Right. So this is early 2001. Um, our criminal justice system, and this is about the prosecution of terrorism cases. Our criminal justice system is simultaneously respected and feared because it's known as a system that cannot be fixed or corrupted. We must make sure that it continues to function fairly and effectively in cases involving international terrorism. Has our reputation, which I think you characterized very well in that time, has it come through with the same qualities in light of everything that's happened, whether it's the uh, Guantanamo issues, the military tribunals, the rendition, and all those other things that have happened outside of the criminal justice system, but that the criminal justice system could not stop. Has it changed, do you think, this perception of the U.S. justice system? Um. And, and what I was talking about, I don't, well, I mean, to, to some degree, yes. I think to some degree, yes. Um, and it kind of depends on who we're talking about. Yeah. Who, who I was talking about there was really kind of the terrorists that are looking upon our system of criminal justice. Um, I don't think that's changed. In fact, I think, you know, one of the uh, detainees in Guantanamo who was an East Africa embassy bombing defendant, uh, I happened to be a monitor for the Defense Department uh, after I left office of the conditions in Guantanamo. And this defendant had just been moved um, up to the Southern District of New York to be tried and con ultimately convicted in that case. And kind of the word around Guantanamo is, you really don't want to go to New York. You know, it's not as good a facility as New York, and you'll never see the light of day after you go to New York. And, you know, so I think the answer is, you know, it, you know, again, we've been through what we've been through with the military tribunals. There were no cases for a while. You had some nicks, I think, based on some of the material support terrorism cases. But I think it's still a respected and feared system. And it should be. Uh, One more. Over there, please. Thank you. <clears throat> you mentioned that a at least overarching theme for 
the terrorists would be to bring down our government, but it seems like most of the attacks have really just been maximizing publicity and loss of life. They're not really designed to bring down the government. So if, if, if it's really that's what it is, they're just trying to make a big stir, how do you ever really think we can prevent, you know, I, I know you can prevent some, but it, there's just no way to prevent them all. I mean, I know I come in from New Jersey on the train, it'd be very easy for someone to step on that train yeah. with a bomb and set it off, and, you know, I get scared every day I do that. But how do you, how do you see that happening in terms of stopping that, and is that really the case? They don't care about the government, just maximum carnage, if you will. I mean, I think there's an ultimate objective that, you know, that, you know, includes undermining slash toppling our government at the end of the day. But, you know, there are lots of steps that are smaller than that, obviously, that we worry about every day. Do I think we can stop every? No. I mean, I think we do everything we, we can possibly. And, and look, we use every tool. I mean, including not law enforcement, not the military, not intelligence, but you know, root causes, that's a whole other program where, you know, we can't get, really get into in any detail tonight. But at the end of the day, I don't think you can stop every attack. I think we're a lot more secure than we were before 9-11, without any question. Uh, but I think, you know, to lower our, you know, our bar of vigilance, huge mistake, and even not lowering that bar of vigilance, I, I don't think we can stop every attack. I think we have to respond to it. I mean, I was commenting earlier, I mean, one of the most remarkable things uh, I thought, and I thought it in 1993 about the 1993 bombing, um, was how obviously six innocent people lost their lives and an unborn baby lost his life in the bombing, but not a single person evacuating the Trade Center died. You know, how can you not have a heart attack? A fatal heart attack. And, and so the resiliency of New Yorkers, and I don't confine it to just New York, you know, in responding to that attack, and frankly in responding to 9-11, is what we've got to you know, always maintain and have, I think. Uh, but I think we're in a much better position worldwide you know, in preventing you know, more and more of these attacks. But you know, it, it's, a, it's a constant you know, battle. I'd like to say it'll be over you know, in my lifetime, but I, I don't see it. Well, that's a mixed conclusion, but I... I um, <laughs> I'm not sure how mixed it is, but yeah, okay. Um, but it's really been remarkable to go back to the beginnings of all of this and to think about it's 25 years, and you have bridged those 25 years in critical positions to see this and to watch how it's evolved. I mean, I think we owe you, uh, all of us, you know, a debt of gratitude for just how effective you and your colleagues were in pursuing these cases and in establishing standards that then spread throughout the system that allowed for the attention and the approach that, at least as best they could, kept us safe against these things. So with that said, please join me in thanking Mary Jo White. Thank you. Thank you.